not having a spell. That's all this stuff. But he is all this nonsense. Will you be quiet? You never did understand. Me. Why don't you get the doctor? I don't want a doctor. We'll never really know what someone else is thinking or feeling because we don't have any direct access. But what we do have are other people's facial expressions, their vocal intonations, their tone of voice, their body language. So we've got uh, external cues that we can use as context when we try to imagine somebody else's thoughts and feelings. But ultimately I see empathy as an imaginative process. We're trying to imagine what's going on in someone else's head. <laughs> Empathy can be taught to some degree. How did you feel? Angry. Angry. Very excited. We've been trying to teach aspects of empathy to children with autism who have difficulties for neurological and ultimately genetic reasons by uh, giving them examples of facial expressions. Almost like an encyclopedia of emotions. For a child who's not picking up on emotional expressions, in the natural way, a bit like learning a foreign language. There's a, a big question to answer, which is where empathy comes from, and in particular what contributes to whether you've got more or less of it. I think a new way of looking at empathy is to think of it as a continuum uh, or a spectrum where different people are situated at different points on, a, on an empathy spectrum, from low through to high maybe for neurological or ultimately genetic reasons, uh, maybe for early environmental reasons, or maybe just transiently, because they lose their empathy um, because of their current state. People who have too much empathy may not come to our attention. They may be working in fields where their empathy actually serves them well and serves others well, the helping professions, for example. And it's not clear that too much empathy ever leads to difficulties. Part of the question scientists need to address is what determines where you are on that spectrum.